Dr. Valentin, I am so excited to talk to you. Um, you're just, your story is so fascinating, just the bullet points I've seen. <laughs> and then just our pre-conversation, I can tell that this is just going to be inspiring to so many people, your story and your background. I want to start with, um, I want to start with your near-death experiences um, and how, I mean, maybe you could just briefly tell, you know, how, how they impacted you, how old you were, just kind of this a summation of those experiences and what what came out of them. Sure. Um, I, yes, I did have two near death experiences, and I won't go into in depth because if I go in depth, it'll take you know thirty minutes. But um, we can do briefly touch upon it. So uh, the story is only about five or ten minutes, so we have time for other conversations sure. as well. Yeah. So uh, my first near death experience was after my third child was born. And I was hemorrhaging after birth and I hemorrhaged for three days. I went to the ER, got sent home eventually and landed back in the ER. And I had uh, really large blood clots, the size of literally a baby's head. Wow. And so this was the fifth time I hemorrhaged and luckily I was in the ER. So the first near death experience, I knew that I was dying. So, um, once the, the big blood clot came out, the doctors, you know, I could hear everybody come into the room and, you know, it's like 10 people in the room and they're tipping my table backwards. And the nurse on my right is quoting my blood pressure. And the nurse on my left is trying to place an IV because she couldn't get in because once you go into shock, your veins collapse. Mm -hmm. And back in 1992, this was in 92, I was, I just turned 34. And back then they didn't place IVs. Today, when you go to the ER, they typically place an IV and they just give you saline solution. And that's because they have access to your veins. If something goes south and you start passing out, they can easily inject medication. But back then they didn't. So she had a really hard time accessing my IV, uh, getting the IV in. And as I'm lying on the table, I have the sensation of just falling through the sky as if you jumped out of an airplane and just free falling to the earth. Mm. And I attribute that to my blood pressure dropping. It just felt like I was falling mm -hmm. to the ground. And when I heard the nurse on my right say, she pretty much yelled out 50 over 15, hurry. And that was my blood pressure. And at 60 over 20, you're, you're going, you started to go below where you can support a heartbeat. Wow. So they kept tipping my table to keep the blood in my head and my vital organs. And mm. it was shortly after the nurse yelled out 50 over 15 that I knew that I was dying. And this experience is very different from thinking you're going to die because my daughter was born between a 7.4 and a 7.2 earthquake. And... <laughs> My <laughs> San Francisco, <laughs> it was Los Angeles in oh. Southern, yeah, in Anaheim. It was the hospital was in Anaheim, and it was the quake that was actually bigger than the Landers quake, but it was situated in the desert, and that's why we didn't have the mass destruction. But the hospital I was in was literally the last town before the desert, so that hospital really shook. We lost all the power, oh, and goodness. my labor stopped, and I that was a moment in my life, one of the moments when I thought I was going to die, and it's very different from the experience I had in the ER because it was a knowing. I knew that I was dying, which was very different from the experience of being in that earthquake when I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. This is it, mm -hmm. and it was shortly after that, that my soul just left the body and I was hovering a couple of feet outside my body. And, but there was the knowing of that, that unconditional love and peace. But I also knew that there was no time. There was no time on the other side and I could access any information I ever wanted. And then I got sucked back into my body mm. and the clairvoyant and clairaudient experiences began the next day. And I had no beliefs. I was I had a very materialistic worldview and I did not believe in God or Jesus, even though I was raised in Sweden and everybody was a Lutheran. I was confirmed when I was 14. I never went to church. I was I didn't believe in anything the Bible said. And I just really, I you know you you die, it's black, you're gone. And that was mm -hmm. my belief. 
So it really threw me for a loop and I wasn't sure what had happened. And I kept thinking, you know, maybe, maybe it's the brain that does this, or maybe it's the lack of oxygen. And I try to, yeah, you, you know, hear, but you hear all those <laughs> stories. Yeah. yeah. All right. Rationalize it. And I was afraid of telling the, the nurse that kept me overnight, of course, telling the nurse of what had happened because I figured they were going to lock me up and, you know, in a mental ward and say, well, she's crazy. She thinks she left her body. So it was really difficult. I didn't want to share it with anyone. And then I got really sick as a result of this. And I had like a sub suppression of the bone marrow. And it wasn't until um, the following spring. So my daughter was born in June. And by the following May, when my daughter was 11 months, I started having big bruises and something, I bumped into the baby's changing table, something that would give you a bruise the size of maybe a nickel, gave me a bruise that spanned my entire hip. And it was just red and purple. Wow. And I, I was getting sick all the time. And I went to the doctor and um, he said, you know, we have to do lab work, but we didn't have insurance. We were young and my husband had taken a new job. So we were on the three month wait to get insurance. So mm -hmm. I said, no, if I, obviously something is wrong. If I go now, they're going to know something is wrong. And it was May. And I said, we're getting insurance July 1st. And then, oh no, over time I got better. But this whole bone marrow suppression literally took six years. And I kept getting better, you know, as time went on. And my bruises, were, after six months, my bruises were, you know, just this big. And every time I put my knee on the floor to tie my kids' shoes, I would get a bruise on my knee. So any pressure on my body would create a bruise. Mm -hmm. And I always had this feeling of my soul wanting to jump out and leave the body. Almost like when you lay a puzzle and the puzzle piece doesn't fit, the last one you have to pad it to, to make it nice and smooth. So it was that feeling of the soul always leaving. And so two years after my daughter was born, when I'm fighting this, I can't stand up. I have a stool in my kitchen because I can't stand up long enough to cook dinner for my children. I have to sit down constantly because my blood pressure is so low because my, I have a deficiency of blood cells, so red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Hmm. So I'm constantly in that I'm going to pass out mode. So it was uh, two years into this. And every day I would struggle with keeping my soul in my body. I would wake up at night, take my head off the pillow, my hands and feet would be ice cold and just feel like, okay, we can't leave. So I was always struggling to hold the soul back into my body. And uh, two years later, I had another near-death experience. And it was one of those nights I'd wake up and, you know, here we go again, take the head off the pillow, you know, hold on to the, you know, soul, don't, don't, don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> and that night it was just like, no, we're leaving. Oh. So that was my second near-death experience. And it was very different from the first one. And now later I joke that they saved me too quickly the first time. So the spirit world was like, okay, we have to do it again. She didn't get the message the first time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have her do another one. Mm -hmm. So the second time it was very different because I just tumbled through darkness. And then I arrived at a station that I call the mid station because it was a feeling of, if you go into a skyscraper and there is a hundred floors and you push the elevator button on floor 50, and you get off at the 50th floor, you know that there are floors above you and you know that there are floors below you, even though you're not on those floors. Mm -hmm. But that was the sensation I had that there was something above me and something below me. And I call it the bouncing station because they sent me back. <laughs> so <laughs> I arrived at the bouncing station. And when I got there, I heard the most beautiful music you can ever imagine. Mm. It's not... It's more beautiful than any music you've ever heard in on our earth plane. It's just angelic. Mm. And I look around and I, I see a log cabin floating in space. And I look inside the log cabin, but there's nothing there. It's empty. So I look to my left and there is an identical log cabin to the one I saw on the right. I open it. There's nothing there. But then I become aware of this growing white light behind me. And as I turn around... And see, and, and I, I'm standing in this light and I'm just bathed in this light. But this light is the 
unconditional love it is but there is a knowing when you, when i was in this light that we come from this life this is the creator the divine source god whatever you want to call it but this is you know just pure bliss and we come from that light and we return to that light but also we carry that light within us but in this light there is an outline of angels and the music is coming from the light from the angels in the light but I didn't believe in angels. So it's fascinating to me that this is what I'm seeing because mm -hmm. it wasn't that I was religious and not where I believed in angels. I saw things and experienced things that I didn't have a belief in. Mm -hmm. And then there were two uh, spirit guides and the spirit guide on my right says, what is she doing here to the other spirit guide? She has to go back. She can't be here. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 wait a second. How can I be here and still be me? How can I be outside my body? And still be me because i had struggled with this now for two years thinking maybe i'm going crazy that must have been some form of hallucination mm -hmm. but now here i am again but the thing is that these experiences are more real than reality sure. and so here i am again having this experience and then the spirit guide on my diagonally to the left in front of me says well if i told you you wouldn't remember but you will remember this and then it is as if I'm standing on the moon looking down on the earth and I see this silvery glittery fishnet around the earth and he tells me everything on earth is connected to each other but everything on earth is connected up to this grid and with that knowledge I get sent back mm. and so for so this is now 1994 so it literally took me a quarter of a century to really start putting everything together and really start to understand how interconnected we all are and mm. how divine our existence really is and so now that has led me to ancestral healing so we're going to talk about oh yes that. for sure well that's <laughs> really fascinating i mean every for the more that i learned about like the esoteric and um healing and the other side of the veil and any kind of energy frequency it's always about patterns you know sacred geometry and like you said the grids mm -hmm. um it's fascinating that you were shown that and how we're all connected in this web of the same kind of energy field or whatever but um before we get into ancestral healing what do you think was the most important thing or maybe the top two things that you really internalized from those near-death experiences was it that we're all connected was that a big a I big think thing? that I mean the most important thing is that life is eternal because when we die we're still there it's just our physical body it is as if you drive a car your whole you know for 20 years and then the car dies and you get out of the car you get into another car you buy a new one right that car died so the body died just like Mm -hmm. if you get rid of the car but you're still there right your soul yeah. is still there and so i think that is the most important lesson is that we have eternal life and i did not believe that prior to my near-death experiences and then um the interconnectedness and how divine our existence really is and how every single soul has a purpose on earth and there are many times when i work with people people are struggling to you know figure out what is my purpose why am i here but mm -hmm. i always remind them it's a life journey yeah you're here it to is, live yeah you're, <laughs> it's your life journey you might never exactly know why because you're here to have that experience if you knew everything it wouldn't be an experience so yeah, you have to true. just you know follow your gut intuition and mm -hmm. listen to that gut mm. So this moved you into, so I think it's fascinating. I don't know what came first, but you wrote a, you, you got the inkling to go to med school at the age of 54. And I was telling you earlier, I'm 53 now. And that's like me going to med school next year. That just blows my mind. At the same time, I told you I want to get my PhD and that's just something on the back burner. So I'm very inspired by people who do these things, quote unquote, later in life. But I feel like fifties are in the new thirties, something, whatever that means, just in terms of longevity and I don't know, things are speeding up really fast on the earth right now. So we need a lot of people in these capacities. I think the wisdom that, it, that it, you know, once you hit 50 or even 40s now, it's like there's this wisdom 
that the world needs from you. And so when you go into a service capacity, that can be really powerful. And before that was the age of retirement, right? Now we're just getting started. (laughs) But you actually wrote a book called Med School After Menopause, The Journey of My Soul. What was that all about? Yeah, so I wrote a book. So um, let me just back up a little bit because it was in 2004 that the spirit world told me I had to write a book. And it was 12, the 12 years after my near death experiences, I became more and more clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient, and started seeing things before they happened and hearing things. And after 12 years of this, it was just the spirit world drops in. I'm like, okay, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, you got my attention because it had been, I mean, you know, some people, they, they learn these things very quickly, but I'm was had such a, a very uh, materialistic and scientific uh, worldview of how things exist and how we exist in the world that it really took me a long time to really understand, you know, how clairvoyant and clairaudient and clairsentient we all are. We are all intuitive creatures, but you just have to tune into that. And for me, it was just a, a learning curve over 12 years of showing me and telling me you're going to be in an accident or which of this truck and, you know, seeing my kids in danger at, at a distance. And it was just this constant um, evolution of my own abilities. And after 12 years, the spirit, I was on the computer and I said, okay, it's been 12 years. My kids are teenagers. I should go back to the workforce. And when I was young, I was a um, business and computer science major. I was a computer programmer and systems analyst for IBM. So oh, wow. That's quite, a, lot, that's quite a jump. In. <laughs> how very, lot very my left mind. brain. Very, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Extremely dominant, right? Left brain. So these experiences really turned on my right brain. That's So it became a, a balance between them more. And uh, the spirit world dropped in. I was on the computer and I saw this. Um, degree and it said naturopathic doctor and I said oh my gosh it's a medical school I can't go to med school I'm already in my 40s you know I'm way too old for this and I'm I'm just going to look tomorrow I'll find something else but I was always drawn to healing because I, I was born a healer my father was a general practitioner and MD my mom was a hospital floor administrator one of my brothers is a surgeon my cousins are doctors or dentists so I, I grew up in an environment of medicine Mm-hmm. And I always, I was always drawn because I, I was always um, wanting to help other people heal. And so, of course, naturally, I'm drawn to to this now, especially after my near death experiences. And uh, I go, I said, okay, forget it. I'm just going to go to the kitchen. I'll look again tomorrow. And on my way to the kitchen, I become aware of a spirit guide, you know, talking to me telepathically. And he says, no, you have to go to medical school and become a naturopathic doctor. And you're to combine East and West, which I took to mean kind of old and new, which is really what naturopathic medicine is, because you learn acupuncture and homeopathy, but you also learn uh, pharmaceuticals and general medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to uh, write a book. And I'm, I'm looking, I'm, I'm like looking to see if I can see the spirit guide. I'm like, what do you mean write a book? I can't write a book. What am I supposed to write about? <laughs> and he said, when the time is right, we will tell you for now, you just go and get your pre-med classes and go to medical school. And you're to bring messages and healing to the people. And I'm like, what do you mean bring messages to the people? What do you, I don't even understand. And again, it's that message just uh, you know, came back over and over again, just focus on getting your degree. So I was enrolled in the pre-med classes within a week or two at the local community college. So I took the you know, biology, the chemistry, the organic chemistry, the physics, the math, you know, the whole thing. Wow, you really acted. Yeah. Like, you and were I, like, you did it. You went straight <laughs> to it. I had nothing because I, I was a business and computer science major. And I grew up in Sweden, in Northern Europe. So, and in, in high school, we major and I was a business and language major. So I hadn't had any science classes since ninth grade. <laughs> so I had to take, I had to take the high school advanced biology and then high school chemistry before I could even get into the college classes. Mm. So I really had to start from the beginning, but you know, everything is possible. So um, that is, so then I got to med school. So after I finished all my uh, prereqs, I went to med school in 2012. And when I got there, you know, I'm just telling the spirit world, I'm here, I'm here. Now what? For four years, 
all they do is tell me, finish your degree, focus on graduating, focus on passing all your classes. And I kept saying, you know, what is it? What, what is the book? What is, what do you mean messages? And they're just constantly would tell me when the time is right, we will let you know, we'll tell you. And that is kind of what my life has been like. And it's just, I've been guided in, you know, for each step on the way. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I graduated, uh, right away, they, you know, I, literally my last month in school, they gave me the title and they said, this, the title of your book is called Med School After Menopause, <laughs> The Journey of My Soul. And I, I said, that. okay. And it's, the book isn't about going to medical school. It's, it's a book about healing and transformation. It is my journey. It has my near-death experiences in it. Um, it has uh, messages at the, each, at the end of each chapter and uh, short exercises that just to help people incorporate it into their own life so that they can um, become who they, were, who they were truly born to be. Mm -hmm. And so it's to awaken people's intuitive abilities by taking them on a journey through my own life. So you have to read it from the beginning to the end because you're not going to be the same Just person. Just to see that development of yeah. how those, those things and became, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it ends with, uh, you know, the divine feminine name and create being creative and all that. Um, but the, the title that the spirit world gave me for the book, Med School After Menopause, they said it has to be titled that because it's to inspire other women to know that just because they hit, you know, midlife and they might be perimenopausal or menopausal, that's not the end of, that's not the end of life because our world is different now and we need these women to be creative and we're, we're trying to bring in the divine feminine and heal the world. And by each person following their own path and listening to their own intuition and doing what they came here to do and that is that true gut feeling that is that true intuition mm -hmm. but we tend to reason our brain tends to say oh no that's not practical just like i did i can't go to med school i'm too old for this but once i got the message from the spirit world you know i understood but that was that was a message for me that's not to say that everybody who's listening to this podcast needs to wait for a message from the spirit world because you already know in your heart and mm -hmm. in your gut, trust that feeling, trust that knowledge that you carry and, and don't listen to that brain that tries to reason things and be practical Yeah. because that true, that true feeling of who you truly are is in your heart. Mm. I'm curious about how the divine feminine came through for you and how that became part of your culmination into like claiming your gifts and just moving forward in, in your knowing, really, in your wisdom, um, because we talk a lot about the divine feminine on this podcast, the sacred mm -hmm. feminine, and um, how, yeah, how did that how did that show up for you? What was that about? Um, I think over time, because it's the divine feminine that is lacking in the world today, because it's we've created a world that's built on competition and power and greed. Um, mm -hmm. Even our medicine, uh, Western medicine, is very much built on, on greed and corporations, uh, pharmaceutical industry, controlling what pretty much what we learn and how to treat conditions. So the only way, so for me, it's that uh, the divine guidance of uh, bringing that, helping women uh, step up to the plate and really take on what they were, what they incarnated for in this life, because we are living in a very transformative period where i don't know if you know the the old um uh, shamanic saying of the the condor of the south and the eagle of the north fly together yeah. Yeah, right yeah, and yeah. so it's the combination of mind and heart and bringing mm -hmm. it together but it's really the divine feminine now men also have a divine feminine side but mm -hmm. what i see when i work with people spiritually either as a, uh, a medium or or psychic or medical intuitive or ancestral healer is that I would say 95 to 98% of my clients are women. And it's the women that are stepping up um, yeah. and creating healing, you know, for themselves, for their families, for their ancestors. And it is all the way I see it is, it is a, a movement of women across the earth that mm -hmm. are here to help uh, change the way we live and our life and business on earth, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's all interconnected and it's that divine feminine within each of us, but it begins with 
each of us listening to our own intuition, our own heart, our own gut feeling and, and following through on that and not letting the brain get in the way. Yeah. I love that. It's, there's an immediacy to the feminine. Like you said, there's, there's mm -hmm. the feminine energy in men, the aspect yeah. of the divine feminine in men as well. So it's not gender specific, but it, it is women. I just, I just kind of have in my mind, I don't know how it worked on the other side before we were born, but you know, and if you espouse to, you know, there's multiple realities and multiple worlds and dimensions, and we could have lived many, many lifetimes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that I heard, a, I heard a spiritual teacher recently say, like, the reason there's 7 billion people on the planet is everyone wants to be here during this transformative time. All the souls <laughs> in the cosmos are like, I want to be on earth right now. Send me. And, you know, we, we did, we signed up for this, mm -hmm. this, this uprising of the feminine, this evolutionary time period where people, you know, are awakening of, to the lifetimes of suppression to this feminine, um, the sacred feminine, you know, and this collaboration, like we were talking about the, the Native American prophecies or whatever, how, you know, everything has culminated to this point where now we have to go together. The masculine and the feminine are now, you know, rising together. And um, yeah, lots and lots of women. You go to trainings, you go to retreats, there's more men coming in, there's more men awakening, but it's largely been female driven because, you know, it's our time and uh, we know it. And I love that we're finally as a collective moving into this place where aging and, um, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't have the same stigma. At least I'm starting to see that more and more. Maybe it's because I'm getting older, but I'm also seeing that, like I said earlier, we're just getting started. You know, when you're in midlife, you're just getting going. You can take all of your lived experience and everything that you've passed through and now gift the knowledge and, and wisdom that you've gleaned from those experiences to the world, to your sphere of influence. And that's powerful. Yeah. I mean, you're, you were talking about your 53 and thinking of getting your PhD. Mm -hmm. And the way I look at it is when you're hit 50, you've only lived 30 years of your adult life. So assuming that we're going to be a hundred and not mm -hmm. another 30 years is only taking you to 80. Yeah. And a lot, you know, if you're healthy, a lot of people are working set to 75 or 80 now, because yeah. I mean, how many years can you play golf or, or knit in the rocking chair? <laughs> you know, one of my, uh, one of my heroines, her name is Ann Baring. She's 90 mm -hmm. sharp as a tack. Mm -hmm. um, she's written dream of the cosmos and myth of the goddess and all these amazing books. But she said since her twenties, I mean, I sh literally, she just turned 90 this year and she's on lots of different appearances and different, she's going to be on my podcast. I'm holding out for that. But she said since her twenties, so 70 years ago, she's been waiting for this day. She's been waiting for this time. She was like, I'm not going to live to see how everything obviously plays out. But she said, it's speeding up so fast. And she goes, I don't mince words anymore, you know, but I just look at her people like her and I'm like, she's 90 and I'm complaining because I'm like 50 something. So I'm not really complaining, but what I'm saying is by the time I'm 90, I can't imagine the transformative, you know, evolutionary periods that we'll have passed through as a collective. I, I, it's exciting. It really is. And, you know, just being in your fifties, a lot of degrees, now going to med school, I had to do the prereq. So that took a couple of years and then med school, which is four years and then another two years of residency. So that is, you know, quite a long haul, but a lot of degrees are a lot shorter, like two to four years. Yeah. And my PhD would only, I think, take me two and a half years. Is what I yeah. It's yeah. nothing. I mean, think of that's, that's really nothing. If you're going to live another 30 years, now you're going to be working with something that you're truly passionate about and that the world really needs, because that's why you were guided to go down that path. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, let's jump into ancestral healing in our remaining time, because that's something that you were shown or maybe mm -hmm. it was an outgrowth of what you were shown. Maybe you didn't have the mm -hmm. awareness or did you during the second near death experience when you were shown, um, by the, by the spirit guide, the, the patterns was that, did you have a knowing at that time it was ancestral stuff or no? No, I really didn't. It wasn't until, cause my focus first after my near death experiences were the first 12 years, I was just shown events that were going to happen. I would tell my kids or my husband, 
write it down in a book so I would know that it wasn't a deja vu and I really did know something about the future. So that took 12 years, then the prereqs and then go to med school. As soon as I graduated from med school in 2016, I didn't even have my license yet. I had just taken the boards and I met this woman at, I was taking uh, classes in craniosacral therapy because I didn't have my license yet. And I was like, well, let me take some more classes. I, you know, pick up some more um, things to do. And she said, I'm a medium. And she had studied at Arthur Findlay College in England. And I didn't know anything about her. And she said, I have your mother with me. Are you open to receive messages? Mm -hmm. And I, even though everything, I had gone to medical school based on spiritual guidance and I still was doubtful that she could tell me anything that you could actually, you know, talking to your own spirit guides is one thing, but to bring in a spirit for somebody else is a whole different thing. Right. Yeah. And I kind of, you know, leaned back and I said, sure, I'm open for messages thinking, She's never going to be able to know anything about me. I was raised in Europe. My life is so different. Sure enough, it was very clear she had my mother with me, with her. And they kept telling me I had to go to Arthur Findlay College to study mediumship. And I kept telling her, I can't. I just graduated. I'm, I'm going into a residency. <laughs> hey, the spirit realm really <laughs> wants you to go to school. <laughs> right? I'm like, wow. I can't do that. And, and after the third time because there were so many things that came through and it was very clear that she had very detailed information about my life that she could not know. So after the third time, I said, okay, fine. I will go to Arthur Finley College and take a class in mediumship. And I have no idea how I'm going to do it, but it's going to happen. Sure enough, six months later, I'm at Arthur Finley College in England mm. taking classes in mediumship. And then that is how, you know, my mediumship develops. And then, of course, many trips back to England and study with, with uh, teachers at this college, which are just phenomenal because they have devoted their life to mediumship. And mm. that's, that's all they do typically is uh, many times they, a big portion of their life, some of them have regular jobs because they do have to pay up bills, you know, and rent and all mm. that. But um they really have devoted their life to mediumship. And so I studied with them uh, for a couple of years, going back and forth. And it was very clear that it wasn't until I was there when I learned that they said, oh, you know, we are bringing messages to our clients, to the people that, you know, come for a reading or a sitting. And it wasn't until I heard that term that all of a sudden I understood what the spirit world meant in 2004. And now it's 2017, 2018. So that many years later, all of a sudden it clicked messages and to bring messages and healing to the people. Now I understood oh, yeah. what that yeah. meant. Right. And so, and then of course I go there and then my, I have a reading with my teacher and she says, oh, you're writing a book. Nobody knew I was writing a book. Uh, all I had was an outline. I had the titles of the chapters. I pretty much knew what I was going to you know, say in each chapter, but I hadn't really started writing. And she said, oh, your mother is telling me you're writing a book. And then she said, oh, your mom is telling me you're to write two books. No, wait, three. And that is the exact message I received in 2004 because the spirit world said you're to write two books. No, wait, three. And I've gotten that message four times from- Wait, so how many books have you written right now? I've written one. It's that <laughs> it was published two years ago. And so, you know, my second book is already brewing. But, uh, and my book also, the one I wrote, the Med School After Menopause, it won an <laughs> award- um, six months ago, I won an award from Living Now Book Awards uh, in, as the first place in spiritual leadership category. Wow. Yeah. So I'm really I want to read it. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. So you were also on the Shift Network on their Ancestral Healing Summit. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the ancestral piece because your mother comes through and obviously she, you can probably see that she's part of this mission on the other side, right? Yeah. And it wasn't until I became a medium. And so now I'm working as a medium and I started having readings probably like two years ago, I think it was. I had several readings in a row where I saw the pattern of abuse within families. And I said, well, you know, I have your grandmother here. She was abused by your grandfather. Your, I see your mother, it was three kids. And then she was abused. And then, you know, now you're born and it's the mom, your mom married the same person as your grandfather. He was also abusive. You know, and I kept seeing that pattern. I had several clients in a row 
that and I started thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going crazy. Why am I seeing the same pattern with the next client? That was my last client. And but it was like the spirit was showing me or giving me these clients so that I could see that there's a pattern to it. And then that brought me um, to ancestral healing and actually studying ancestral healing um, with other physicians or, you know, family constellation uh, therapy counseling mm -hmm. with other physicians and counselors like around the world. And it was um, during the pandemic. So everything was online and I had wanted to take this class many times, but there was always something in my schedule that prevented me. And now because of the pandemic, it was offered online. And so I went through that whole training and then everything started to click because I could see that it was an integration of the counseling that you learn going through medical school. And we have to learn to diagnose according to you know, the DSM-5 mm -hmm. and be able to send them along to a psychiatrist for evaluation, all that. So you do get a lot of counseling classes in med school, but then I also st actually studied ancestral healing counseling. And so you have a lot of tools from that how to see the patterns within families and where it's coming from. But then that got combined with my mediumship skills because that's how it all started. I would see it, um, you know, because the spirit world would say, oh, here's the grandmother, here's the grandfather. Uh, show me what, how that family lineage, you know, had that trauma that was passed down. Mm. So it was, and now, so it's now it's become, uh, you know, med school, uh, ancestral healing, uh, mediumship and my training in shaman, shamanic studies. So it's become an integration of all of it. And that's what led me, I think, to be invited to the Shift Network to speak at their Ancestral Healing Summit. Mm. So what is the, what have you found? We've done a couple episodes uh, on this podcast on ancestral healing, and I know everyone kind of has a different take on it. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is at the heart of it in terms of like, let's say you, you have this awareness and sometimes we don't have the awareness of mm -hmm. what we're carrying epigenetically or whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, let's just say you do have the knowing of some of the, like in my family of origin, mm -hmm. lots of bipolar, lots of suicidality, lots of addiction mm -hmm. on both sides. And um, so I, so I, um, and I have a sister who took her life and mm -hmm. an aunt who took her life. And so so that's just in my immediate focus because I, I'm like, this has to go back so far. So we actually climbed into, um, healing our ancestral lines. My sister, well, okay. So my sister completed suicide in 2005, mm -hmm. my remaining sisters and mother and I, we really climbed into how do we break these patterns? Mm -hmm. So this doesn't continue. And so we were just like, as we started working with healers, we, mm -hmm. it was multiple generations. This has mm -hmm. been going on in our family lines mm -hmm. way, way, way before you would have even put a label to something like depression, bipolar, anxiety, yeah. whatever, mm -hmm. just the crazy factor. That word crazy, mm -hmm. um, was something that was literally passed down and passed down and passed, but lots of mm -hmm. gifts too, mm -hmm. high gifts. So, so for for your, um, when you, when you speak about this to groups and you really climb into it, like the heart of it, mm -hmm. what do you think shifts these ancestral patterns the most profoundly? If, is there, I'm sure there's not just one thing, but what's at the heart of it, I guess, is what I'm asking as you see it. Mm -hmm. So when I work with people, so many times people sign up for a medical intuitive, which then turns into an ancestral healing session or vice versa, right? So, but many times um, people struggle. It could be a physical problem. It could be an emotional problem. But once you start having a conversation with that person, you start seeing the patterns and you can see where it's coming from. But once you understand why you're struggling with a problem, whether it's physical or emotional or spiritual, that is when you can create healing for it because it's that aha moment of, oh my gosh, I, now I understand why I struggle with this. It's coming from, you know, my mom or it's coming from my dad or my aunt. Or, it didn't start with me. I'm not, and that yeah. can actually be very liberating for people that, that this is a bigger problem than you. Mm -hmm. You just happen to be carrying it. It's not mm -hmm. who you are. You're just carrying yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's exactly, I studied with Mark Berlin. It didn't start with you. That's his famous book. Oh yeah. 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 Um, and it, it is a great, um, you know, ground floor is it really lays out the, the, 
the beginnings of ancestral healing. It goes so much deeper than his book, but it's a great way to open up um, those pathways in your brain so that you start understanding where it's coming from, because you can see how it is in you know, how it is the the actions and the reactions and the interactions of your ancestors that they then change their epigenetics and their DNA and they get passed down through the generations. Um, so they've done, you know, there is one study, the very famous um, mouse study. Has anybody spoken about the mouse uh, study? I'm not sure. Um, it is a famous study that um, it was called um, Ancestral Odor Fear Conditioning. Um, um, and it was published in um, the uh, Nature, uh, Nature Neuroscience, I think it was, uh, back in 2013. It was a study that was led by Brian Diaz at the Emory, uh, Emory University, Emory School of Medicine um, back in 2013. And what they did is they took my, male mice and they exposed them to cherry blossom smell. Oh, the cherry then, blossom study. I love yeah, this. Yes, and then okay. they, they, they give them an electric shock. And so now yeah. they fear the cherry blossom smell. Then they took the sperm from that mice, artificially inseminated the female mice, and then their offspring, those little pups, feared the cherry blossom smell just based on the sperm that was passed. Even though out. they didn't have that direct experience, it was exactly. epigenetically encoded. Yeah. So when that. you think about all of our ancestors, pretty much have been in wars. So if you think, okay, grandpa was in a, in a war. Every time he heard the siren go off, he thought. You know, he took cover, he's, the airplanes are coming in, they're going to drop the bombs, and this is the day I'm going to die. And so he flips his epigenetic mark markers because of his reaction to that terror and that fear. And then he survives the war, he has kids, and then those children have children. So now the granddaughter is born. The granddaughter has panic attacks every time she hears the siren. Mm. But she has never had any traumatic experiences about sirens, she's you know, nobody works in the police or fire department, anything like that. And then you trace it back to, it's the, it comes from the grandfather. It's the grandfather's fear of sirens that is passed down to the granddaughter. Mm -hmm. So see how it's, it, it can show up like that. And, and it so, can be, you know, three or four generations removed. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so you have no idea why, why am I having, or why is my child experiencing these fears? But it could be that it's just passed down from earlier generations. So there are different ways of looking at where things are coming from and why it's showing back up in your life. So fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think that that's part of the interconnectedness, isn't it? Like I look at it that way. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like how <laughs> things manifest, you know, that mm -hmm. connects you to your family lines, which you connects you to the greater. I mean, it, it didn't start with an ancestor either, right? Mm -hmm. These, um, human conditions we face, these issues, we're all in it together. We're all, you know, as we clear it, we're not just clearing it for ourselves and our ancestral lines, mm -hmm. we're clearing it for the collective. And mm -hmm. we're sort of all moving together as one organism, really. Yes. That's, the inter that's how I kind of view the yeah. interconnectivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like, okay, so when you were having, I just have to ask you this, when you we're having your near-death experience and you saw the still, you call it like a silver web over the mm -hmm. earth. What were they trying to say about the earth's mission with the greater cosmic plan, the connectivity to that? What was your understanding of that? Um, well, all they told me was that the message for me was that we are all connected. Everything is connected on earth, like all the humans, the plants, the animals, we're all interconnected. So we are all one. Right. So it's, it's so like, mind blowing to try to like, I've heard this so many times <laughs> and I'm like, I, it's, it's just really, your logic brain does not know how to place that. Yeah, Gosh. we are, we are all affected by each other. And I talk about it in my book too, how our heart has electrical impulses, right? We measure it with an EKG, but our heart resonates and entrains with other organisms. So, you know, if you go, you know, if you go into a room and somebody's mad, you feel it. And then now you're syncing up with that person. And now you're mad too, because they're mad. Or if somebody has loving feelings for you, you're like, oh, I feel so good. This person is right, sending me love. And that is how we sync up with things. But we sync up with everything. We sync up with animals. We sync up with plants. And we sync up with things, whether it has a heart or not. So 
that again just shows you just even our heart how it syncs up forget all the energetic ties and strings and you know ancestors and all that i mean just our human being we are already connected with everything right just by our physical body but then we are also connected through you know the tr trauma that we inherit on our dna that comes down so we we inherit the trauma of the grandfather who lived in the war and that's on our on our genes and then if we also have traumatic experiences in our own childhood and that you know helps flip all those genes so it's our own reactions to our own circumstances and our own actions and interactions with other people that then is going to flip our own gene markers and create an experience so when you go if i drop you off in the jungle in front of a lion you're not going to sit there and say I'm going to dilate my pupils. I'm going to increase my heart yeah, rate yeah, so that I can run. It. Right? It's like you're it just, just going to do it. Yeah, and it's the same with with all of these things. It just happens. It's that it's automatic. Hmm. We don't even notice it. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like we are being breathed. You know, if it's, if 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 you're still here and you're still breathing, there's something supporting you. There's something higher keeping you alive, beating your heart, you know, like those, all those autonomic nervous functions and stuff that yeah. I, gosh. Okay. So, uh, when we talk about, cause I, I want to wrap this up in a way that feels like, oh, I could just keep talking to you forever. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how to bring this back. So let's just say this. So for Oh, I want to ask you, there is something I forgot to ask you. I am a like nerd for reading near-death experience books. So that's why I want to read yours. <laughs> but um, my kids laugh at me because I've read all of them. I think everyone that I've ever found out about, I read. So one thing that I noticed as a very universal, um, I guess, aspect to somebody who dies, crosses over and comes back, mm -hmm. is that somehow they get this very clear knowing or message, maybe it's an overt message they hear from a guide or deity, or they just know that it's just about love, mm -hmm. that, that the whole entire matrix, um, the web, the net purpose of life, et cetera, it's all just about love. Did you, did that come to you at all? Yes. It's, I think that's a universal message that and the ears typically get because it's all based on love our whole universe it's that because the light is unconditional love and we have we're part of it we carry it within us and it's having that unconditional love for other people but that's also a very difficult thing um to always do the right thing when we're human because our ego gets in the way we feel yeah. hurt by you know the actions of somebody else and then to still have that unconditional love is hard and that's but that's really what it's all about it's mm. to create that unconditional love for everybody mm. yeah and i think the big lie is that, that we've bought into as a collective is that we're separate from that love and it's created all this warring and you know all this toxic masculinity and the patriarchy and mm. it's all been about power over instead of with and collaboration yeah. and it's kind of circling back to what we were talking about earlier with the divine feminine is we're now moving into this era where where people are awakening to the fact that we are one with this divine feminine force that has been not talked about not acknowledged um sort of put in the background and it's her time now yeah <laughs> it's her time <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's so funny you know what yeah so coincidental but i just found this card that it's actually one of my cards that i made my soul declaration cards but i just looked at it and it says i am one with the divine feminine so that That's was beautiful. sitting here looking at me while we were talking the whole time mm -hmm. well thank you so much this was really great how can people find your book and then where's the best place to to follow you online or to find you online? right um my book is on amazon and many other uh, book platform online book platforms across the world uh, it is available as a print, print regular book, uh, Kindle and audiobook. And so it's available on au different audio book platforms as well as Amazon. And the best way to find me is to go to Dr. Lottie, D-R-L-O-T-T-E.com, drlottie.com. And from that's, 
has more of my medical information working as a physician, but it's connected. So it says, if you want to work with Dr. Lotta spiritually, click here. And then I'm totally going to book a you. session with you. <laughs> that takes you <laughs> to the talking to you, I'm like, because I love how you have the science and the esoteric. So do you have all mm -hmm. these disciplines that you've studied? Mm -hmm. But what strikes me as we've been talking, just kind of look, looking into your eyes mm -hmm. here and getting a feel for what you're about, like you have a really balanced approach to um, helping the body and the mind and the soul heal. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like you were led to these places to study, but you're still grounded in the most important aspect, which is love and that, mm -hmm. and the force of that and how that heals. And so, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm intrigued. Um, mediumship is, is so multifaceted. Uh, you talk about being these things like clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient, all of those. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and like you said, everyone is that are, has those capacities. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just honor you for stepping into these roles and publicly speaking about your own lived experience around this and how it came forward for you. But I also get the clear sense that you're trying to empower others with that same thing. You're not I don't get any ego from you is what I'm saying, which no, is kind of rare. <laughs> um, that's what my teachers at Arthur Finley College also tell me. They're, when they work with me, they're like, wow, you, you've you resolved your ego. You don't have an ego. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I say it's unusual, fast, but yeah. it's uh, I, I would attribute that to my near-death experience. I know what I'm here to do. I know I'm here to um, help inspire other women to step into their power uh, to help them find their own divine feminine and to help heal them and heal the world. Because by each person that I can help heal will create healing for them. But everybody that they come in contact with, because we are all connected. So by me helping heal them, they will heal others just mm. by being healed themselves because they, there's a shift that is created within them. Right. Mm. And so that is, so it's like, for me, it's like every person I can help heal, I'm helping create, create healing for the world. So beautiful. Wow. Well, thank you for, for showing up and saying yes and not dying all those years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much. And, um, yeah, just, uh, everyone go to her website and, uh, thank you. Thank you for today. This was, this was very inspiring for me personally. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Um, um, um.